This is Saving the Game, a Christian podcast about tabletop role-playing and collaborative storytelling. Recorded Thursday, March 21st of 2019, it's episode 149. In this episode, Unlikely Heroes with Reverend Derek the Geek Preacher White, plus our D&D alignments, a dress rehearsal for a new thing we're doing, Critical Core, Unsong, and more. Welcome to Saving the Game. I'm Peter. I'm Derek. Oh, sorry. I'm so used to going last. And I'm Jenny. <laughs> I should have okay. jumped in there. <laughs> yeah, I was like, what is going? Did did you just drop? What, what happened there? <laughs> no, I'm here. You want to you try that again? Or we... I'll leave it in. It's fine. All right. All right. <laughs> okay. So as you can hear, we are missing Grant. But we have gained a Derek. Yeah, we have gained a Derek. This is actually going to be a little bit of an unusual episode in some ways, but it may not sound particularly like it because whether or not it sounds like it to listen to, this is actually kind of a, should we call this a preemptive crossover, Derek, with a a podcast that you've been thinking about doing? Yeah, we could call it a preemptive crossover or or more like uh, you uh, opening up baby steps for the possibility of a podcast. You know, you could be birthing a podcast. Let's call it that. (laughs) (laughs) You've been talking about wanting to do a series of conversations with various people kind of in our, call it a ministry space, us, MinMax folks, inroads people, that sort of thing. Folks maybe that don't do the uh, geek theology or geek ministry in audio all that often for a few of them. But that went from like a down the road thing to a hey, we're not going to have Grant for this episode. Would you like to come on and give it a shot early? So, And with less than 24 hours of notice, Derek said yes, and here he is. So thank you for coming on on such short notice, and I think we've got kind of a cool topic to discuss tonight. Well, thank you for doing this for me. I really appreciate it. No problem. Just in case this is somebody's first episode, why don't you... Tell us who you are. Not that Jenny and I need to know. Oh, no, yeah. yeah. There might be a listener or two out there. Well, my name is Derek White. I'm an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church. I've been ministering in the United Methodist Church uh, now for about 12 years, but I've uh, been in ministry for over 25 years in various denominations and organizations. Some people out in the world know me as the geek preacher uh, because I've done a lot of ministry at various gaming conventions throughout the past decade. Decade or more. I also am the chaplain for the Gary Con Gaming Convention. And so at various gaming conventions, what I'll do is I've facilitated worship services. I've held prayer breakfasts. I've led panels on faith and gaming, where we have interviewed uh, people in the gaming industry like Larry Elmore, Frank Mincer, and a variety of others. And a lot of times, some of those interviews have popped up on various podcasts such as your own, uh, such as uh, Inroads Ministries, Game Store Profits podcast. So that's kind of the space I inhabit and have been doing that for the last, uh, started officially doing it, I guess, in 2008, but I've been doing it on and off uh, since uh, the early 2000s. Yeah, you predate pretty much all of us in this ministry space, except for perhaps the Christian Gamers Guild, which I think has been around since the 90s. Yes. Uh, and of course, I was a part of the Christian Gamers Guild. I, I joined them in the mid 90s, early to mid 90s, 94, somewhere between 94 and 96. As we get older, the date, dates get fuzzy. And so I've been a part of the Christian Gamers Guild and I'm a member at large. They gave me that title before my wake was what it is so (laughs) so they didn't mean it as he's a big guy but uh but yeah i am a member of the christian gamers guild which started out as an email list back in the day uh where we would discuss things via email then it turned into message boards and uh and is still an email list today and the christian gamers guild has members who have been uh for over 20 plus years setting up worship services at gaming conventions for Christians who might be missing church on Sunday, but want to gather with like-minded folks and worship. And those uh, worship services are always ecumenical. Uh, In fact, sometimes they're even interfaith, even though they're not specifically interfaith services, but we've uh, we've had people from other religions come. We've had atheists and agnostics come and join with us. And it's been a really, really fun, interesting 
ministry to be involved in. Yeah, the one at GaryCon this year was pretty cool. Yeah, and I was glad you could join us for GaryCon. Uh, the last few years at GaryCon, uh, that started out at GaryCon. GaryCon was where I used to go for fun. I would just go to Gen Con, and I would do a lot of ministry at Gen Con, run booths, run panels, and preach at the worship service. And it just got to be so much that I just went to GaryCon, and I would go there for the fun of it. Uh, and then a, a number of years ago, Gary Khan was going to end on Palm Sunday. And I had people going, hey, can we have a Palm Sunday worship service? And I went to the leadership at my church and I said, are you cool with me not being here on Palm Sunday? Because that's a big one to ask to be gone mm-hmm. on. Right. And they said, uh, what, what are you going to be doing? And I told them they had already known about what I'd been doing. And they said, we'd love for you to do that. And uh I uh, got a district superintendent to come in and preach for me on Palm Sunday, and I went there, and we held a Palm Sunday service uh, with communion, and uh, someone brought us a ton of palms, so we had palm leaves. Uh, we were in the middle of a dining area. It was before Gary Khan had moved to the Grand Geneva. It was at the old hotel space, and so we're right there in the middle of the restaurant, they have this kind of center area where you can normally eat, and there was about 30, 35 gamers there you know, uh, worshiping, praying, and celebrating the Eucharist together, which was pretty awesome. Yeah, that's amazing. And then after that, you know, a few years later, because I would volunteer and help out, uh, Luke said, hey, Derek, uh, you know, uh, would you be our chaplain? And uh, Luke Gygax is, uh, you know, he's a military guy, so he understands the need for chaplains in the military and in the world at large. And he's like, hey, would you be the Gary Khan chaplain? I was like, dude, man, I'd love to. So what I do at Gary Khan specifically is I take care of the memorial table because Gary Khan is a memorial convention where uh, Mm -hmm. they honor the life of Gary Gygax, the co-creator of Dungeons and Dragons. So we set up a table. We put some D&D books on it. We put some uh, books that Gary used to read. He would read like uh, books on ornithology and other things like that. So they're on there, magnifying glass. There's kind of a little ashtray thing because Gary used to smoke, but you know, nobody's smoking there, but you know, there's that there's his Zippo lighter. Uh, we set that up, put a picture of Gary up. And then, uh, the last couple of years, one year I put up a, uh, a white wall where people could just sign the white ball and remember their friends or uh, write about how Gary had impacted their life that and this year I kind of put up some poster boards where people could do the same thing. And so it's kind of a memorial area where people could go and remember how Gary Gygax touched their lives, but it also allows them to memorialize their fellow gamers who have passed on. And so there's a lot of that that goes on. So I take care of that. I help out with the opening ceremonies. I give an opening benediction at Gary Khan. Uh, I go to a lot of the events there. If people want to get married at Gary Khan, if they want a Christian wedding, I talk to them and I help facilitate that. I've done, I've done a wedding at Gary Khan. Uh, if they're, if they don't want a Christian wedding, I help facilitate it with people who might, you know, want a secular wedding or a non-Christian wedding or a a wedding from from another religious perspective. And so I'll try and help them find someone who would be willing to do that wedding. You're a busy guy at that convention. (laughs) Like, yeah, (laughs) you know, it it was funny. You were you were saying um, when I was down there hanging out with you a little bit, somebody, I think it was an industry figure approached you and was like, what do you really do here? And (laughs) You gave him a, a list fairly similar to what you've just given us and then said, I'm also available, you know, when people want to have dinner and talk about things. Yeah, we were actually having dinner and he's like, he he actually is a volunteer. He works with the convention and he was like, he was wanting more details of what I do with the convention just out of curiosity. And so I told him and, I, and then I just kind of smiled and winked at him and said, plus I make myself available to have dinner with folks like you because we were having dinner <laughs> together and which was really nice. And I enjoy it a whole lot. You know, uh, I, I do want to reiterate, I don't get paid for that. Uh, Gary Khan is nice enough to provide me a room uh, as I come because they consider me a special guest, which is still weird. You know, uh, when I got back from uh, Gary Khan, people at my church were like, hey, how'd you like it? You know, are you coming down from the vacation trip high or whatever? And I said, well, I said, it's not totally a vacation anymore. I said, but the hard part is, is when I go to Gary 
Gary Khan, you know, I get treated like a minor celebrity and then I come back here and I'm just your ordinary pastor to you guys, you know. And so and they look at me kind of like, what are you talking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, shut up, Derek. Just be quiet. You know, that's just the preacher over there. So I do that. And of course, I have to also say something else I was a part of, which I really enjoyed, was the Fantasy Makers documentary on the lives of George McDonald, C.S. Lewis, and J.R.R. Tolkien. So I was able to be a part of that documentary. So I just do all kinds of things where my geekiness and my Christianity overlap. So for those who don't know me, that's who I am. Yeah, that is a fantastic documentary, by the way. They did an excellent job. I pre-ordered that before it actually came out. I watched it the first day I had it, and I, if I'd had the time, I probably would have watched it a second time right then and there. I've lent it to my folks. They really enjoyed it, so. Yeah. I still have yet to watch it. I should probably watch it, because I'm related to George McDonald. <laughs> my family would yell at me if I don't. <laughs> see, see, what was funny for me about the documentary is... I was given a copy of the pre-release, you know, before it went to DVD or anything. And I watched through it and I was like, oh, that's really cool. And then when it came out on Amazon Prime, I showed it to my wife, you know, and some friends came over and they watched it with us. And I was like, yeah, here it is. And then a few months ago, someone I, and I, I had bought a copy of the DVD just, you know, for my own to have a copy of the DVD. And I was on a uh, interview with this guy and uh, I had um, Andrew Wall, the producer on there with it, me. And the guy said, yeah, Derek, and I really like the special features in the documentary with you in it. And I was like, wait, wait, there's special features. And I had <laughs> no idea. So on the DVD, there's actually a section of special features and I'm in the special features and I'm like, dude, now how cool is that? You know, I get this. Like, I need to, yeah. I need to look that up. I didn't realize that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. It's like, it, I, I'm talking about dragons and stuff and the theology of dragons. And he put that in there as a special feature. And I was like, what? How did I not know this? How did I not know this? And so, so now I'm an Easter egg on a DVD. So <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <Nice. very cool. laughs> yeah. One other quick bit of um, business before we get into our Patreon question, our scripture, and our main topic. Mm -hmm. We actually, Jenny, did you want to take this one or do yeah, you want sure. me to? Yeah, sure. So um, okay. there is a new little link on the show notes from our previous episode about uh, implementing angels in games uh, because the designer of... of one of the games I mentioned, the designer of Exodus, Erica Shepard, um, sort of jumped in and was like, hey, just letting you know, this game is about a lot more than angels. Angels are sort of like, not flavor text, but they're sort of the vehicle for discussing other topics and stuff, specifically um, transgender identities. And oh, there's a lot of explicitly like, Jewish imagery associated with the source material for her game. So uh, we had a lovely conversation about that. If you want to read that on Twitter, uh, we've got a link in the show notes from the previous episode. W what's the name of that game again? Exodus. Exodus. Making yes. a note of that. Yeah. And it's it's based on the album uh, Transangelic Exodus, which is about um, a guy and an angel running away from a fascist regime, a fascist city. Oh, wow. The, some of the lyrics are not safe for work, but I really enjoy the, the style of music. I, I enjoy it. I like it. That sounds awesome. It is. It is. I've got to die here. Let's see what we get for our Patreon question. All right. Oh, this is appropriate with, uh, with Derek here. We get a question from another pastor about D&D specifically. What is your D&D 5e alignment and why? Oh, my Lord. Uh, is it horrible that are, are all the D&D 5e alignments just like I don't know enough about 5e. I play 5e. <laughs> it's, it's it's the, the same standard as 3.5. Three okay, by three okay. alignment. Yeah. Grid. It's not like 4e where they modified it a bunch. It's it's just yeah. 5e. For me, my actions are neutral good. But I feel like I should be doing chaotic good things. <laughs> um, just because my job makes me want to do insidious book things. Like, I want to put in <laughs> books that I know no one's going to read at my library, but I feel like they should be there anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I'd say neutral good actions, chaotic good heart. <laughs> Let, let's go with that. 
Also, I think insidious book things maybe should be another T-shirt design. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I would say I'm neutral good. You know, uh, you've, I value personal freedom tremendously, but I also see the need for laws. But when laws abuse or hurt people, I will break those laws. Uh, if a law is abusive to someone, I'm not going to blindly adhere to a law just because the powers that be say I have to, especially if that that law is harmful to uh, the poor, uh, the uh, orphan, the widow, any laws uh, that that are counterproductive to society and to uh, any laws that hurt the weak. Yeah, I'm going to be neutral good where that's concerned. So <laughs> neutral good allows me to obey the laws that are good and go all chaotic. Like Jenny said, go all chaotic <laughs> against those bad laws. So yeah, yeah. Neutral good. I would say that I'm recovering lawful good. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Try, trying to get more into kind of the space that the two of you occupy much more naturally, it sounds like. I, I tend to be very um, kind of instinctively pro-society, pro-rules. I just, I have a very concrete brain, um, which can cause me problems with scripture interpretation and stuff, too. Mm -hmm. Like, one of the things that I have struggled with throughout my life is because I am so concrete and so rules-focused, it's very easy for me to read even the New Testament through a very harsh lens mm. and, you know, wind up kind of terrified by scripture sometimes, including stuff that's not supposed to be that way. So, yeah, I, re recovering lawful good, striving for neutral good is probably what I'm going to go with. I think I probably, you know what, I, I'm thinking about it. I think I feel more chaotic than I actually am. Well, oh, no, you know what? First thing I bought for myself when I got my own place was a crowbar. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not joking. That's Please bad. do not provide context. Um, this is okay. going to be so much better with I mean, it. there really isn't. I just wanted a crowbar. Like, I wish there was more context for me to give you. There's okay. not. I just wanted a crowbar. <laughs> but like, uh, okay, this is even better because Jenny's like, well, I'm all out on my own. I can make my own decisions. You know what? I've always really wanted a crowbar. I'm a drive to the hardware store. Yeah, I got the second biggest one they had. It was harder to lift the first one. Wow, that's hilarious. <laughs> I, I can just see Jenny because I've seen, I, I haven't ever met Jenny, but I, I've seen <laughs> pictures of Jenny and you're about the size of my wife. Uh, my wife yeah. is five, five foot, you know. Tall, mm -hmm. very petite, and I could just see her swinging a crowbar. I really could see her swinging a crowbar at me sometimes. Yeah. But well, uh, <laughs> Also, a thing to consider, when I moved to Newfoundland, I'd actually, I was the most muscly I've ever been. I may or may not have actually had, like, real biceps. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, well, she's I, tiny, but she's a former rugby player. Oh, I am, yeah. Okay, um, okay. And, and I'd been working out regularly for, like, a solid eight months or so. So um, I, I actually had muscle. Like, the crowbar would have been an actual threat. <laughs> there you go. So, so do we get to speculate what alignment Grant is since he's not here? I think Grant's neutral good. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, with leanings toward the law axis, because I can't see, I, I've never seen Grant as, as chaotic. He's way too organized to be chaotic. Yeah. See, I think I think he enjoys law, but I think he's also in the same boat as you, where it's like, if the law is unjust, he's not going to do the unjust. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. And he's also he's also got the kind of um, lawful doesn't necessarily mean law abiding thing going on. Grant is very organized. He's very ordered in his thinking. Oh, yes. You know, he's he's you know, it's I, I have to kind of constantly remind myself that Grant does not have several advanced degrees because he talks <laughs> like somebody who does. So let's put this in terms of original D and D, where they didn't have the good and evil axes. They had lawful, neutral, and chaotic. And I just finished reading uh, Three Hearts and Three Lions by Poole Anderson, and he talks about that. And so chaos is not necessarily evil. It's about the movement toward disorder. It's about the movement toward, you know, everything just falling apart. It's almost about a movement toward decay 
whereas law Mm -hmm. is a movement more toward order and keeping things, you know, in check so that we can live in an ordered world where no one is harmed. And so in old D&D terms, I would be considered probably lawful because they didn't really focus on neutral a lot. But I, I would say I would, in those terms, moving toward order and moving away from decay, I would say would be what I would fall into on the old D&D lawful, neutral, chaotic spectrum. Yeah. If we're going old D&D, then I'm definitely chaotic. <laughs> I'm really about like busting stuff up. Like, Oh, wow. I'm, I'm about shaking things up very much. Oh, um, wow. So yeah, I'd I'd say like ah uh, yes, I I'd say not like full on chaos, but like I, I like to shake things up a bit. If we're gonna go with uh, an axis that doesn't have good and evil on it, I am lawful as lawful yeah. can be. Yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> I mean, to to give you um, an example, the the last time that uh, the same guy that asked this one, uh, Doug Hagler, asked us a a question. He asked, "What other um, religious tradition would you go into if Christianity wasn't an option?" And Grant and Jenny answered Buddhism, and I said Sikhism. So yeah. that, that should tell you everything you need to know. Yeah. See, and then here's the funny thing: I'd probably be a pagan. So you know, mm. you know, uh, I, I probably would. Uh, you know, because a pagan, then I, you know, I'd be a modern pagan where I could take some things from Buddhism, take some things from here. I'd just be a good old syncretist and just mix and match, like you know like uh, so many people do today. Mm -hmm. But that's because I have way too much education on world religions. So (laughs) (laughs) yeah, there you go. All right. So should we get into our scripture here? Derek, since you're the the guest, do you, well, okay. Do you want Exodus or Isaiah? I worked for Corinthians. I worked (laughs) for that reading. Uh, I'll do Exodus. I'll do Exodus. Whenever I do Exodus, I always think of Bob Marley, Exodus, when he sings Exodus. So I love Exodus. Exodus chapter 4, verses 10 through 17. Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, Who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? It is, is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord, please send someone else. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. And he said, what about your brother, Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you and he will be glad to see you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. But take the staff in your hand so you can perform the signs with it. And we have Isaiah uh, 6, verses 5 through 8. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. And we have 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 2 through 11. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. All right. Like I said at the top of this, we've uh, we've got a topic that Derek has brought to us, and he's going to kind of be taking point on this, so... 
Derek, what are we talking about tonight? You know, as I began thinking about these things and I, I think about them and I bang them around my head and I don't always get a place I can talk about certain things. In. And so I brought this up to Peter and Grant and a few others. I said, you know, uh, I, I just want to talk about these things. I don't really have a place to talk about them sometimes. And one of the ones that's really just been kind of dealing with, especially with the prevalence of superhero TV shows and movies and everything out there, I began thinking about the unlikely heroes, you know, the unlikely heroes that we have in our culture, people we would not expect to be heroes in literature, in comic books, in popular media, and who those heroes are. And so what I want to ask you guys is actually a question you guys throughout here is what makes a hero unlikely? What makes it, you know, because when, you know, a lot of times when I was a kid, we thought of a hero, it was Superman. Of course, Superman is a hero. He's big, he's strong. He has all these wonderful powers. Uh, but now we see more unlikely heroes. So, well, and the other thing that's interesting about Superman, since you bring him up, is not only is he big, strong and powerful, He's also got all of this wonderful privilege that kind of shaped him into that sort of a heroic person, right? He was, mm -hmm. you know, he was raised by these two wonderful, kind, loving people who kind of kept him humble and taught him the, you know, gave him the moral compass that he has. He didn't have a lot of adversity growing up. So he's got kind of like this well that he can draw on. And, you yeah. know, it's like it's still very impressive because it would be very easy for somebody with that much power to be, you know, cruel and exploitative with it that he chooses to do good. But it's not hard to see how he wound up as a hero with the background he has. Yeah. And he came up and even though uh, his creators were Jewish, they wanted him to have this middle America Protestant moral background because that's what, you know, people saw as this really, you know, as that framework in the 40s and 50s and 60s that kind of gave you your morality. And so they wanted him to have this Protestant Midwest kind of morality, which shaped him. And so, yeah, you're right. It, that is a huge level of privilege he had where Batman, on the other hand, you know, he didn't he didn't you know, he didn't even have time for his moral compass to really set it set in when, and when his parents are blown away. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, he had all kinds of money and stuff, but he certainly didn't have the upbringing. <laughs> yeah. Raised by an ex special forces butler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's there's also plenty of like arguments to be made that Batman is much more of an anti hero than a hero. He's not a nice man. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. And he's he's very very selfish in a great many ways. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I see Batman as an unlikely hero. You know, uh, he could have grown up to be a spoiled rich kid. And here he is, you know, and he he does that whole playboy attitude as his kind of uh, cover. But that's who he could have really been if he, this tragedy hadn't struck him. He could have turned into just this partying playboy guy that he makes himself out to be. Yeah. Or heck, even if the the tragedy had still struck, he could have still ended up like that. Yeah, that's it. Certainly happened enough times in real life. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Like, because if you want to look at who's got kind of the best, who's the least anti heroic out of the people in the kind of the bat family, as it were, the two people that well, the three people that immediately come to mind are the first Robin, the third Robin, and Oracle. <laughs> it's like Tim Drake, Dick Grayson, and Barbara Gordon are all just very straightforwardly heroic, as is uh, Barbara's dad, Commissioner Gordon. Mm -hmm. and, and the rest of Gotham is like patrolled by all these angsty anti-heroes with all of this baggage. And yeah. Like <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, honestly, that's, that's why uh, I, I got frustrated with the Green Arrow TV series, because Green mm -hmm. Arrow really is Batman. You yeah. know, uh, his whole arc is Batman. You know, he he's on this boat. His father ends up having to commit suicide so that Oliver, Oliver Queen can live. And so it's a very tragic, dark thing. And I'm just I'm frustrated with it personally, because that's Batman's story. You took Batman's story and you ran with it and you just put, put it on Green Arrow, whereas in in the Green Arrow story, he lived on this island by himself. 
he was kind of like a Robinson Crusoe and he came back and he's this rich guy and he just wants to be heroic and he stood up you know he wasn't in, in the 80s Green Arrow was an environmental activist he was so, yeah he, he was considered an environmental terrorist at times so he and he would stand up he was the classic liberal so to speak he was the type of guy who stood up for the environment he stood up for workers who were being mistreated by their employers and so he was this wealthy guy who saw his wealth as a responsibility but then he had got these special skills and so now his special skills are used to also fight crime and so green arrow was was a much happier character to me and uh and i do get a yeah little... oliver queen is definitely a little more well adjusted than bruce wayne in the comics oh, very well adjusted he, he's fun and and that's why i liked a uh, green arrow in the justice league cartoons they did that he was just great he was fun he was witty and that's the green arrow i i fell in love with yeah so what exactly makes now that we've defined what a likely hero is what makes a hero unlikely um we sort of talked about that with moses um moses had some sort of speech impediment we aren't sure exactly what it was but it may have been a verbal tick it may have been a lisp we we just don't know he's he was slow of speech so he wouldn't be the kind of guy you'd necessarily go to immediately to you know talk to people smoothly <laughs> right right i mean well you know when, even when he commits that murder when uh you know he he murders the uh, slave master who's mistreating a one of the hebrew people later someone else saw him do that and they go to moses and they say who are you to protect us so he obviously didn't come across as this great protector and leader to them yeah, a lot of them probably kind of thought he was a little bit of a dirt bag, at least, or you know, mm -hmm. a loose cannon at best. I mean, yeah, yeah and they're and the guys, they're guys afraid that Moses might kill him. You know, so so obviously Moses uh, probably had a short temper. You know, so that that would be an unlikely hero. A short temper, some physical disabilities will tend to make somebody an unlikely hero. Okay, if we're going to talk about physical disabilities, we got to bring up Daredevil and Hawkeye. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Yeah. I mean, Hawkeye is deaf. They literally did like an entire issue of his comic in American Sign Language when his hearing aid stops working. Wow. Like, I, oh man, that, that, that volume hasn't arrived at my library yet, but I'm so looking forward to it. It's such a good, ah, it's so good. It's such a good <laughs> example of... Of portrayal of the difficulties with disability and still being able to do hear, hero things and have your hero job, but not be able to hear a single thing. Well, there's no A in hero. <laughs> oh, um, that's bad. I'm that's sorry. Bad. That's <laughs> horrible pun. Continue. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and the thing is that distinguishes Hawkeye from Daredevil. Daredevil is blind, but he has this this amazing sonar. So he <laughs> yeah. gets his blindness replaced with a superhuman ability. Hawkeye Not entirely replaced. It does still become an issue like if he similar to Hawkeye if he is deafened for whatever reason. Like, right. you just got to clap your hands on either side of his ears and he's back to blindness. Give him something printed on a flat surface. Yeah, exactly. He can't read the newspaper. Yeah. Yeah. That, and that's true. That's true. Uh, you know, but he's he still got a bit of a superhuman ability. But Hawkeye, uh, just like the Black Widow, they're, they're just normal humans who, who have really been trained. Really, they, they've just trained their bodies. Now, Daredevil trained his body as well. But uh, Hawkeye just has to has to deal with it. And he doesn't. Uh, yeah. So I, I really like I, I really like heroes like that that are just ordinary people, you know. Uh, yeah. I think that in today's world, we we see more of that. That you you know the ordinary person used to be the unlikely hero, like like Bilbo and Frodo. They're they're ordinary people. They're the ordinary guys. Uh, they, they're, you know, that's why Tolkien wrote them. They were the everyman, so to speak. And that used to be the unlikely hero. But now more and more, 
they're making ordinary people unlikely heroes. We see that more and more in comics and in TV shows. You know, uh, Luke yeah. Cage to me is a really good example of a guy who is just an ordinary man, uh, a preacher's son in the, in the, uh, Netflix series. He's a son of a preacher. Uh, he's wrongfully jailed. He's just an ordinary guy who gets these powers and doesn't know how to deal with them because he's an ordinary man. He doesn't even really want to be a superhero or a protector. He's just an ordinary guy who suddenly got these abilities. And we see more and more of that. So, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, that would have been an unlikely hero. But now the ordinary man is the likely hero, you know. The the thing that I really liked about Luke Cage, too, is how untheatrical he is most of the time. Yeah. Like, there's there's this great scene at the beginning of one of the episodes where there's a bunch of these criminals standing around, like, with this illegal weapons shipment that they've got, and they're, like, cocking the guns and looking at him and stuff. And he just kind of walks up, and he says in just this long-suffering tone, do I even have to say it? And they all just <laughs> scatter. Yeah. 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 I love that. Yeah. Yeah, he's not there to look fancy or, or flip around bunch of swords and stuff he is there to finish a job yeah yeah and he gets ticked off when they blow it he's like why do they keep shooting up my hoodie man they, they know those bullets don't work on me quit messing up my hoodie <laughs> yeah. man i like my hoodie yeah. Uh, yeah 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 and so so yeah the 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 ordinary guy now i would say you know I kind of like that the ordinary guy becomes the likely hero because then in real life, we look around and we go, you know what? Maybe I don't want to mess with that ordinary person over there. They, they, they might be like Jenny and they'll have a crowbar with them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or perhaps, you know, just like. I can do something. Yeah. Not only that, but like you look around and it's like, hey, you know, these people might seem ordinary. But you don't know what's under the surface. You know, this this person may be capable of great things and you just don't know about it. You know, it maybe teaches you a little bit of respect for your fellow man. And it also teaches us there's a greatness in us that we might not recognize, that there's a greatness within all of us, which is, you know, a very Christian sentiment, that there is some sort of greatness. The image of God is within all of us, no matter how broken or decayed it might be, we still have vestiges of the image of God. And so there's greatness in every person. There's greatness yeah. in everybody. The here I am, send me. Yeah. The yeah. two people that come to mind when I hear you say that, Derek, one of them's real and one of them's fictional, and they both have the last name of Rogers. <laughs> <laughs> Fred Rogers, the real one, saw that in people and wanted to try and make them see it in themselves. Yeah. And I think that's one of, you know, for all of the wonderful things that he did, and it's a long list, I think that's probably his most enduring legacy is that he was able to kind of like, he saw everyone as special. You know, he could he could kind of take that and through kindness and respect, kind of hold up a mirror to like the best parts of people and, and let them see it for themselves. And then on a more kind of like um, the internal becoming the external, the way that the the uh, super soldier serum that made Captain America who he was worked is at least the way they described it in the movie is it takes whatever you are and makes it more. Right. Yeah. So it takes this gutsy, courageous, decent human being with an almost perfectly calibrated moral compass and this scrawny, sickly little body and gives him all of the physical capabilities that he needs to go and do what he's trying to do with what he's got anyway. Mm -hmm. And that's really cool. Yeah. I, uh, I love, st I loved, and I still say that is probably my favorite movie in the Marvel cinematic universe is the first captain America, the origin of cap. That is when you see that there's so much beauty in that story. I, I still love the scene where they're talking about him. They're looking at him in this soldier's outfit next to all these big buff soldiers. And then they throw a grenade out there and he jumps on it, you know, and, and everybody else scatters. Right. And he is there. And that, that right there, it, 
that shows you the hero that he is. I mean, before that, you see him fighting a guy in an alley and doing stuff like that. But in this moment, you realize you see a hero who's going to lay down his life for other people because he believes so strongly in that. Uh, you know, when they ask him about Nazis, so you just want to go kill Nazis? And he says, I don't like bullies. You know, that here's this person who he has this scrawny, weak, sickly body, and it's just there. And yet he, he could just go and cry and mo bemoan his state. But instead, he does everything he can to try and fight against these these people he views as bullies. <laughs> It's a it's a beautiful story. Uh, I could I could go on forever. And then Fred Rogers, who you know, you talk about Fred Rogers, and I love Fred Rogers. My wife and I uh, downloaded the documentary on Fred Rogers, and the idea of Tom Hanks in a movie playing Fred Rogers just makes my heart sing. But uh, Fred Rogers, well, he was a hero because he tried to bring out the best in children. Yet Fred Rogers was also a hero because of what he did when he went before the Senate asking for funding for PBS. He here's this man, this unpresupposing man sitting in front of all these hardcore senators and he convinces them. You know, it's a beautiful video. I'm sure you've seen it. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and it, these. You can see the senator's mind changing in real time as he listens to him. And it, it is just so powerful because we forget the inner heroism of Fred Rogers, because that takes a lot of nerve to to go before Congress and to sit before them and advocate for what you're advocating for. And he did it not in a flashy way, you know, Mr. Rogers neighborhood, you know, I, I, I'm going to tell you, Mr. Rogers neighborhood coming from my background, it reminds me of how we argue in church. You know, some people in church, they want the smoke machines. They want the really big, huge praise band. They want all this cool, flashy stuff in their worship services at church. And, uh, you know, I, I argue for simplicity. You know, uh, I don't have any problem with pomp and circumstance. I don't have any problem with, with uh, liturgical garments or incense. But, but we don't, I don't really care for all the electronics and stuff there in that space because I want to keep it simple and real. And that's what Fred Rogers was fighting against. Here he is coming up in a time when cartoons are really becoming big and all these other things are coming out. And here he is, he's doing simple hand puppets on television and yet has ratings go through the roof for decades. And that I think is because, and that that's part of what defines a hero, whether they're an unlikely hero or any other type of hero, they have a passion for other people. They care for other people. But then you got those heroes that really, you know, they they have a lack of willingness. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, those accidental heroes or heroes that just are, are unexpected heroes. Yeah. Bilbo. Prime example. Basically, the entire time is like, I want to go home. <laughs> I'm having a bad time. I don't want to do this. You messed up my house. I want to go home. And who can blame Can't him? Can't I just go home and get some sleep? I, I want my four meals a day. Come on, man. What's going on here? Yeah. Yeah. And then you got Paul. You know, um, mm -hmm. Paul started out. He, he was... He was he he was an accident. He became an accidental hero for Christianity. I mean, he was motivated to uh, be this this tough guy following his own religion. But then suddenly he finds himself knocked on his rear end, and suddenly, you know, he doesn't know what's going on, and he becomes this this basically guy who wrote a great portion of the New Testament. And he he's pretty amazing there too. Another thing that makes him unlikely is the way that people initially treated him because they knew of him as a guy who was persecuting the church. And it took a long time for people to warm up to him. Um, I considered putting a, a portion of first uh, of the first chapter of Galatians in there that talks about how when 
he first tried to become a good a good Christian, the the church was basically like, uh, no, we don't trust you. We have no reason to trust you. The only reason that he was accepted the way he was was because of Barnabas, who who advocated for him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. There, there's that. There are the heroes who who nobody trusts. Uh, Deadpool's kind of that way, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, um, Deadpool's out well, there. I guess, you know, I guess. You know, we we're on the other side of the fourth wall, so we trust Deadpool. We do. Yeah. We trust Deadpool because because he breaks down the fourth wall and he talks <laughs> directly to us, so we know where your heart is, Deadpool. But the other people don't. The people no. who have not seen past the fourth wall, they're like, "Oh my goodness, this guy's crazy." You know, he's going to kill people. He's going to do that. Well, I don't, I can't trust this guy to do the right thing. And that, that is a constant thing, especially in the Deadpool movies, which I love, you know, is there like, we can't trust you. And the person watching the show is like, of course you can trust Deadpool. You know, he's going to do the right thing. Uh, well, right ish. Um, cause he's also, I, I would also count him in the, continual messing up hero oh yes oh yes yeah because because he he makes some bad decisions oh you you, you want to talk about heroes that mess up how about my like new testament namesake that guy screwed up yeah, quite a bit. Yes, peter, yeah yeah oh yeah man i love peter i love peter i will never deny you by the time the cock crows you're gonna deny me three times here's the rooster crow oh no i denied him three times you know, and I love Peter because he's still a. And I was talking with a colleague a while back. We were talking about this, and I I always like to say I'm a Peter wanting to be a Paul. You know, because when Paul Paul realized he was going the wrong way, he just grabbed a hold of grace and just went whole hog with grace. You know, I we misread Paul so many times. You read Paul through the lens of grace, and you're going to go, "Oh wow, this yeah, this guy's pretty amazing." But so Paul, you know, grabs a hold of Jesus, and he just goes whole hog. Here's Peter. I love Peter. You know, Peter's like, okay, I'm not like you said, Peter. <laughs> Peter, 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 Peter. Peter. <laughs> You know, Peter says, you know, I'm not going to deny you. He denies the Lord. He doesn't go to the cross. He's not there. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus has his conversation. Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Yes, Lord, of course I love you. And so we see Peter rise up. And then on the day of Pentecost, Peter gets out there and it's like, yeah, man, he preaches his sermon. Everybody comes in. And then just a few chapters later, he's like, oh, no, Lord, I'm not going to go to this Gentile. I've never eaten an unclean thing. Why would you send me to the Gentiles? No. <laughs> you know, and suddenly <laughs> the Lord's like, take a look at this Sheet, yeah, Peter. and so then he goes to Gentile, and he's like, "Oh yes, Gentiles, yay!" And then you read Galatians, and suddenly you know Peter's playing the hypocrite again. Uh, the the Hebrew Christians come along, and they're sitting down eating, and Peter's like, "Well, I'm not going to go eat with the Gentiles; they might talk bad about me." So I love Peter because he is a constant example of someone who's trying his best to follow what he believes in. But circumstances, you know, he, he falls because of the circumstances around him. And, and and that's my life. I feel like that's my life so many times, you know. <laughs> yeah. Mine too, and I've got his name. So. Well, yeah, you're doubly <laughs> cursed there, brother. You know? <laughs> yeah. There's a line from an online book series called Unsong that I really like. The the main character is a a person who goes by the title of Singer. And and the quote is, a singer is someone who wants to be good. And this guy, th this main character in Unsong, he messes up a lot. He's he's very much the accidental hero. He accidentally finds a, a word of God, which gives, you know, immense power to, her, to whoever says it. And he continually just, like, makes these bad choices and and but still tries to be good and he tries to do good with what he's been given. It's been so out so long since I read it. I can't even remember the main character's name. I should have put it in the show notes, but yeah, unsong is a solid piece of media for like the mess up heroes, the, the tries to be goods. Since we are getting up on time here, I want to hit this all good as God's good thing that you've got in the outline, Derek. So can we yeah. maybe like, 
transition into that? Well, well, the best way to transcend into all good is God's good is this idea of the hero. I, I put this in because Jenny brought up one of my favorite accidental heroes, but he's more than an accidental hero. He crosses many, many categories of unlikely hero. Unknown hero. He does heroic things in spite of himself. He he tries to do the worst thing possible and ends up doing something good because he's really bad at being bad. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, of course, is the hero of Kenton. The man we call oh, Jane. Jane. <laughs> he robbed from the rich and he gave to the poor. Stood up to the man and gave him what for. Our love for him now ain't hard to explain. The hero of Canton, the man they call Jane. <laughs> Yee. He had good old Jane Cobb, yes. <laughs> yep. In in our denomination, Peter and I's denomination, the United Methodist Church, we talk about this thing called prevenient grace, and that is the grace of God that is spread abroad in the world, and it's God's goodness which is poured out upon all creation. And that's what Jane did in doing this, in trying to rob from these people for his own selfish gain. And he loses this money and it helps the poor who have been stolen from. He did God's good work. And so whenever good goes out into the world, no matter who does it, whether it's accidental, whether it's unintentional, whether they meant to do evil, as the scripture says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. And that is why all good is God's good. Anytime something good and kind goes out into the world, no matter who is you, who does it, they are doing God's work in the world, whether they recognize it or not. Now, on them, it's a very sad thing if they don't recognize God is working through them. On them, it's very it, it's very hard, and I, I wouldn't want to be that person. But that's still God's goodness flowing in and through them. Yeah, I was kind of you. You put the the note in there, and it's like, okay, I could see where he could go a couple of places with this, but I just I want to hear you say it. Another good example of the all good is God's good thing is: Have we brought brought up Hellboy yet? We have not. We have not. And Mike Perna will disown us if we don't. So. Here's here's Hellboy's backstory. Nazis try to summon the devil. And he turns out to be a decent guy. <laughs> the the devil, when not in the hands of Nazis, turns out to Well, not only when not in the hands of Nazis, but when in the this little demon baby guy, yeah, gets adopted by this wonderful, like, kind, decent man and decides that way is better to go. <laughs> yeah. Hellboy frequently feels sometimes a literal pull back to evil, and he continually, at least from what I've read and, and seen in the movies, continually chooses good. It might be messy good, but it's still good. Uh, oh gosh, I just I just really like Hellboy a lot. I, I, I think I think probably the best mental image of Hellboy that can exist is like. You know, somebody being like, hey, you're this powerful, evil thing. You know, why don't you come with us and we'll give you like all of this, you know, stuff that you could want and him just giving them the finger and walking away. Yeah. like <laughs> That is like the essence of Hellboy. Yeah. Just like a straight up. No, like a lot of the time it's just like you should you should come with me and, and embrace the void is like, no, no, here's my gun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And what keeps Hellboy stable and embracing that which is good are his friends. It, it, that's how they try and, you know, take Hellboy down all the time and get him to give in to this dark side is to get rid of his friends. But it's his friends yeah. and those that love him and care for him that kind of keep him on the right track. Yeah. I'd say that Liz is also a, a screw up hero a lot, at least in, in the first few volumes that, that I've read. She is incredibly self-destructive and self and full of self-hatred and self-loathing. And she makes really bad decisions that it end up, you know, being destructive, but in the end, uh, an eventual good. She almost commits suicide, but brings back to life this homunculus who is then able to save the day using the powers that she gave him. That that's one of my favorite arcs in the whole comic. I I absolutely love that 
that particular arc. I'm trying to remember the name of the exact volume, but I, I read it in an omnibus. I don't know the name of the volume in particular. Um, but yeah, Hellboy is, is, it's just such a good, just such good. Well, you know, it, and when I think about that, and I think about Hellboy doing these good things. I remember uh, reading some back in my both pre-seminary and seminary days, reading some of the early church fathers. And one of the things that some of the early church fathers really believed was that even Satan would be redeemed, uh, that all things are redeemed and all things are brought into God's good grace. And that, well, well, I know that for some Christians, that's a controversial topic. I mean, they, there are early Christian fathers who truly believed that. And uh, it, it's a powerful thought that God can bring redemption and healing even to the most evil of souls. And uh, one of my favorite series from when I, I was a kid, it's by Piers Anthony called The Incarnations of Immortality. And in it, they have a scene where Satan is redeemed. In the series, uh, human beings take on these multiple incarnations. Uh, you know, some take on the incarnation of the Earth Mother, some take on the incarnation of time, and a person takes on the incarnation of Satan. And one of those incarnations of Satan becomes redeemed in the sense, I think it may have destroyed him when he became redeemed, but uh, he starts singing an old gospel hymn and just kind of poofs away. And uh, the idea of ultimate redemption is just such a powerful thought for, for any and all heroes, because isn't that part of the hero's journey is to seek redemption, to seek healing, to seek something better, and uh, to uh, actually hit and make that happily ever after point. <clears throat> and this is the point at which I recommend God's Demon by Wayne Barlow yet again. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, paradise lost in reverse. One of the, one of the Lords of hell decides that he's had enough and wants to go home basically, and is kind of determined to take anybody who wants out of this whole evil thing with him. There's some interesting like historical figures and stuff that are in hell that kind of join his group and he does an imperfect job of it. I mean, he's a demon, you know, he's it, good is not in his nature you know he has to really work for it and he makes some screw-ups on the way and he does some kind of exploitative stuff to the people who are his allies that is kind of not cool in the process but he's very sincere about it and it's uh it's an interesting book i would definitely recommend that one i'm definitely gonna have to check that out because i uh read a series of books just a while back well read uh, listened to and it's called, the series is called Circles in Hell by Mark Cain. And it's about a guy who's basically hell's janitor. Uh, and it's funny and humorous. It has humorous twists, but it deals with people who are in hell that really don't seem to, to be there, shouldn't be in hell. And I won't give away because there's plot points if I go into it, but it's kind of like, uh, you know, in, in one area of it, they had, this isn't giving something away, but. Florence Nightingale, she got she went to heaven, but she goes down to hell to alleviate suffering in there. Huh. So it's like she says, you know, I can't. Re it's not really heaven for me if I know there are people suffering. So I she she goes down to hell and stays down in hell a lot of times, just trying to alleviate suffering. And of course, the devil and the demons always try and warp her alleviating suffering. And I will say, this is a book that's probably rated PG thirteen to R. You know, it's got some uh, sexual content and other things, but there's this whole theme of there are people here who, who may still need redemption. I mean, C.S. Lewis even did that in uh, in The Great Divorce. Mm -hmm. And the people who uh, I love it. What I love about The Great Divorce is the bishop who refuses to accept heaven. You know, I think we need to make every United Methodist bishop read it. <laughs> None of them listen to this podcast, I don't think so. so. <laughs> maybe not the bishops, but certainly the people who voted at General Conference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe they need to read that. <laughs> the bishops came up with the one church plan. I think they would be fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've met a couple. Uh, yeah. You're, you're, yeah, you're much know. nicer than I am. You're much nicer. <laughs> I'm in the middle of appointment season, Peter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you've told me. Yeah, it's like, uh, 
My prayer at night is, Lord, send me someplace nice in spite of the bishop. <laughs> you, you can edit that part out if you want to. I, I'm I'm surprised your prayer at night isn't just this again. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it should be this again sometimes. Oh, Lord, what am I doing? Uh, you know, make me a real itinerant preacher. Just let me walk down the street going, alms, alms for the poor, alms, <laughs> alms. We are getting close on time, so I do want to leave you with a funny story. Uh, on the fantasy end of things and on the geeky end of things. So I know, uh, I know you guys are younger than me, but when I mention this movie, I know both of you will have seen it. And that is the life of Brian, right? Yes. Yep. I no joke did a book report on the life of Brian. You were awesome. Or not a book Jenny. report, like a speech. You're awesome. You're awesome. Thank so you. I was trying to, uh, you yeah, know, we've been helping some people at, at, at our church, we have a food pantry and we offer financial assistance when we can. And I was trying to explain to uh, this younger man in the church, you know, about how you have to be cautious, how you help people. Uh, and, and the example I wanted to give him was from the life of Brian. Now, I know this guy. He's geeky. He actually DMs a game I play in. I should have been playing him tonight, but I wanted to do this podcast, so I begged off on the game. Well, thank you for skipping game for yeah, us. I didn't you. realize you were doing that. And so I was trying. I said, have you ever seen The Life of Brian? And he said, no. And I'm like, my goodness, what are we teaching our geeks today? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no Monty Python. Come on. That's basic. Yeah, I know it. I mean, it's D&D 101. I mean, come on. Where are you coming from? Next thing you're going to tell me is you've never seen The Princess Bride. He, ha- <laughs> he has it. He has it. Oh, my oh, it, 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 it tears my, my soul. It t- tears my soul. <laughs> but the line I told him, I said, you know, I said, well, we're helping people who are in need. We do have to be careful that we don't give them too much help because they're not going to know how to handle it. And, and so I tried to explain to him the scene in the life of Brian where the, the I believe it's Eric Idle running out. And he's going, alms, alms for a former leper. Alms for a former leper. <laughs> and they're like, former leper? What are you talking about? Man, I was just sitting there, and this Jesus guy walked by, and he healed me. I didn't ask to be healed. Now what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to make a living? You know? And, 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 and the guy's looking at me like, he's like, okay. You know, because he doesn't get it. It's, it's an irrelevant thing there. But but mm-hmm. it was just to me, the, that, that to me is just one of the quintessential scenes. Uh, because to me, Monty Python is one of my unlikely heroes. They are my my weird heroes because and that was because I, I, I'd always loved them as a kid, but when I watched The Life of Brian, the special features on The Life of Brian, the American whose name I always forget, but he was he was part of the Monty Python's flying circus, he said this line, he said we, we looked at it and we started reading the Gospels as we're doing the life of Brian. And we didn't want to go after Jesus because he's just too good of a guy. Why would you want to <laughs> piss on Jesus? Because you just can't read the Gospels and say anything bad about this guy. And yeah. when he said that, I was like, dude, you're my freaking hero. You are my hero for saying that because he just read it honestly. And while he may or may not follow Jesus, that's his choice, whatever. But the fact that he would just recognize the beauty who is who is the most unlikeliest hero of them all, Jesus the Christ, Jesus the son of Joseph, a carpenter born in poor circumstances, uh, had to uh, sleep uh, down with the animals while he was born. Uh, what an unlikely hero that is, the God of the universe who knew what it was like to be sick, to to be hungry, to be lonely, to be sad, to feel lost, to feel mistreated, to feel angry. And yet he becomes the greatest hero of all time by willingly laying down his life to on, on the anvil of human violence. You know, there's nothing more powerful than that unlikely hero. Yeah. Agreed. And there is no better note to end this on, I think. Uh, yep. So, Derek, thank you so much for coming on, especially yeah. since you had to skip game and you did it on such yeah. short notice. Hey, man, thank you for having <laughs> me. I've been wanting to do this, and uh, I uh, just enjoyed it so much. And it is just such a pleasure. It, it is such a pleasure just hanging out with you guys. I, this has made my mm-hmm. week. It's been a rough week, and so you just made my week, and I really appreciate that. 
Well, Same here. Feeling Same it, yeah. Here. The feeling is mutual, and uh, now we can get all of our listeners to pester you to do more episodes like this with us and other people, and that's sort of, yeah. We'll, we'll host the audio. Well, so. and I appreciate it. I, I do want to do more episodes like this, and I do like having good people like you and Jenny to talk to. Uh, though, as you continually tell me, Jenny is awesome, but that's self evident. Uh, you yeah. know, and Jenny reminds me that there is hope for the younger geek. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah <clears throat> yeah her and the min max folks are good for that <laughs> oh god i just love all you people i just if we could all just if i could put together a mini convention where we all just got together for like three or four days mm-hmm. and just just uh a mini re- spiritual retreat Ooh, now there's it you, oh, you could yes. edit this out but mm. maybe you know, you know that guy's doing that. Uh, he does those D and D retreats, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. May, m- oh, yeah, the ELCA. Yeah, guy. maybe, maybe I need to host a uh, spiritual life retreat for podcasters. Ooh, Ooh. I like that. Ooh. Yeah. Well, maybe we can kill the recording and continue to plot and scheme <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, folks, for uh, listening. We are saving the game, obviously. If you want to ask questions like you heard at the beginning of the episode, we have a Patreon that you can join at any level, and that will get you question asking access to us. Uh, We are on social media, Facebook and Twitter as Saving the Game. We do streams every Friday. I'm doing a stream. I'm excited. I'm switching games. I'm going to be doing uh, 80 days, which is around the world in 80 days, but really sandboxy. It's going to be really fun. Awesome. Yeah. And yeah. speaking of games and communication, we have a Discord server that you can find the link to at our website, stgcast.org. Wait, well, one last note. One last note. I, I want to promote something that I have no dog in this fight. Oh. Critical okay. Core. Critical Core yes. role-playing game on Kickstarter. It's still got over 30 days left at the recording of this podcast. So it'll have about two weeks left when it drops. I have a son who is on the autism spectrum. I have been trying to run role-playing games with him, and we have been trying to work with him on empathy. And everything I'm seeing and hearing about this this uh, Kickstarter and what they're doing is it works with children and helps them develop empathy. And uh, I think it, it can be used with autistic children. It can be used with children who are not on the spectrum. It can be used with all kinds of people. Uh, I have supported it. I'm backing it. Uh, lots of other people are backing it. Please, even if you can't afford it, just go give them $5 to say how important this is to get in the world. One of the great rewards on there is you can buy yourself a full version of the game printed with digital files but you can also buy a version for someone else out there in the world that they'll send it to and give people who are working with children uh, on the spectrum and with developmental and emotional need problems and they'll give them a free copy of it as well Mm -hmm. oh that's awesome yeah it's being made by the guys from game to grow who we've had on the podcast uh before so yeah, yeah and those guys in. are amazing. So, yeah. yeah, definitely give them some love yeah, and, <laughs> and some money. Yeah, <laughs> it, 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 if it's okay with you guys, please put a link in your show notes to that Kickstarter because they are a nonprofit organization. They are a 501c3 charity. And uh, so everything they're doing is purely out of a desire to minister to. They may not say the words minister, but that's what they're doing. Uh, that's all good is God's good. There we go. There's the connection. Yeah. That is God's good being put out in the world. <laughs> All right. And on that note. <laughs> yeah. By the way, we had them for episode 115. I'll link that. To yes. You. So, okay. Really on that note, we are done. Have a yes. good one, folks. Good night. We will good night. catch you next time. Good day. <laughs> See ya. This has been a production of Saving the Game. All episodes are produced and published under a Creative Commons 4.0 attribution, share-alike license. Our logo is by Ruben Smith Zimple of 3d6design.com. Our music is The Promised Place Beyond the Clouds by James Opie. You can find more of his music at nihilor.com. To hear our past episodes, to find syndication and license details, to connect with our fantastic listener community, or to contact us or support our show through Patreon, visit our website at stgcast.org or savingthegamepodcast.org. God bless, do good, and happy gaming.